Getting the Nintendo 64 on Christmas Day 1997 will go down in my lifetime as one of the most memorable gaming experiences of my time. I have fond memories of being an 11 year old and simply being in awe of Mario's new 3D environment. The future had bloody arrived and that day I had buckets of fun playing Lie That Wars, Mario Kart 64 on 4 player and even a bit of Killer Instinct Gold. On this day in 1997 I was so impressed with the Nintendo 64 that the bloody console made me spit my tea out in glee. At that moment in time, I was 100% sure that I had made the right decision by bypassing the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. In my little head, the 64-bit Nintendo platform would dominate the generation. For the past few years previously, I had been a Super Nintendo owner, which is an amazing 16-bit system with a disgustingly brilliant library of games to choose from. Over the mid-90s, I got somewhat sucked into my own little Nintendo fanboy world. And after all, why the bloody well not if I was so happy with my SNES? It made complete sense to me to ignore the release of the PlayStation 1 and Saturn and simply wait just that little bit longer to become a proud 64 owner instead. As good as the Nintendo 64 was, and as happy as I was to own one, I quickly came to the realisation that the system had one massive fatal flaw, and that was a severely embarrassing lack of games available to play on the system. Even to this day, with the console's life cycle being complete, the amount of quality games available is lacking in comparison to the vast majority of other platforms. Look at the depth and quality of the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo libraries for example. The 64 simply cannot match that. So, what did 13 year old me do to rectify this problem? Well, in 1999 I asked for a Sony PlayStation for Christmas. This opened up a world of choice to me gaming wise, much like in the days of the Super Nintendo. No longer was I restricted to only being able to play a select few games, as the Sony PlayStation offered a plethora of choice. On top of that too, with the system being out for a few years and the CD format being cheaper to produce than cartridges, hundreds of games were available from £10 to £20 each, which was a massive difference to most games on the Nintendo 64, being a whopping £50 to £60 each. So essentially, I had great fun over this era. The combined efforts of the Nintendo 64 and Sony PlayStation nourished my gaming needs. So in theory, I didn't really need to even think about other systems. So you can see why really that the Sega Saturn got pushed to the back of my consciousness. I definitely have memories of discussing the Sega Saturn in school playgrounds, but sadly for a long time I think I just ignorantly wrote the platform off. Apart from having my needs fulfilled by the other two platforms, my partial ignorance would have simply stemmed from the fact that I had never actually got to play on a Sega Saturn. I didn't know any children that even owned them. The only first account stories I would hear about the platform was children playing them on their uncles, sisters, boyfriends and stepfathers systems. That sort of thing really. And even if I did hear about them, the games I would hear people talking about were exactly the same games I would hear about on the bloody PlayStation. Games like Resident Evil, Croc, Tomb Raider, the mass advertised multi-system releases. So essentially, I thought I already owned all the good Sega Saturn games on the PS1 instead. Even into my mid-teens, I began to continue to believe the myth that the Sega Saturn mainly only had games that were also released on the PlayStation. This theory was boosted by regular visits to boot sales, where often the only Sega Saturn games I would see for sale were games like FIFA, Rayman and Die Hard Trilogy. I suppose this must have been due to the fact that the professional resellers would probably snap up all the good ones and stick them on eBay, before I even got a chance to see them. 
So overall, the various multi-platform third-party releases ignorantly led me to believe that the Sega Saturn was basically just a Sony PlayStation, but with less choice available. However, as I grew into adulthood and slowly became a gaming connoisseur, I soon learned that my beliefs were far from the truth. As of 2017, I have built up a decent gaming library for all three of these systems, and I am now a firm believer that the Sony PlayStation offers by far the largest selection of quality games out of the three consoles. But that's a whole story for another time. Today's video is about comparing the Nintendo 64 and the Sega Saturn, a console I loved in my childhood and a console I have grown to love in my adulthood. I am going to be analysing the libraries of both of these fine systems and putting forward my subjective opinions on which consoles fare better and in which areas. Why am I doing this you may ask? The simple answer is for easy views. It's clickbaity, the sort of video imbeciles will argue about in my comments section. However, the most important reason for this video of all is that I strongly believe that the majority of people out there are still completely ignorant to the Sega Saturn's greatness and would have wrote off the system much like I did in my childhood. Today, I would like to bring the Sega Saturn's quality even further to light so that more people can share in the system's fun. I am not comparing it to the N64 so that I can bury the Nintendo as I believe it was a quality product for its time. In fact, I am comparing it to the Nintendo 64 because I believe fans of that product will be able to get equal if not even more enjoyment from the Sega Saturn. People need to be experiencing this sometimes overlooked gaming gem. In theory, I believe if you like the 64, you will love the Sega Saturn just as much, provided you give the thing a chance. Before we move on to the Sega Saturn's strengths over the Nintendo 64, I think it would be wise for me to discuss some of the 64's strengths. It might even prevent the Nintendo fanboys from screeching in my comments section. Actually, no, it probably won't. This is the internet after all. Lowbrow pillocks everywhere. Anyway, one of the genres of games the Sega Saturn can't compete with, which are available on the Nintendo 64, are 3D platformers. The best ones on this system are all collector ups. The release of Mario 64 inspired Rare to do a good job of cloning the game, creating Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, Conker's Bad Fur Day and Donkey Kong 64. This selection of games are probably some of the best bloody collector marks of all time and they were all exclusive to the Nintendo 64. Whilst all this was going on though, fun was still to be had on the Saturn, as you had some of the notable multi-system 3D platformers available, such as Croc and Tomb Raider. Both of these games are solid efforts, although neither of these are in my opinion as good as any of the big 5 3D platformers on the 64. Outside of these collect em ups, the Nintendo 64 also has the Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask two games which are regarded by many as two of the best games of all time and arguably two of the greatest games in the entire Zelda timeline. These games are both amazing and there isn't really any games even comparable to them available on the Saturn. These two games are 3D puzzling and adventuring at their finest. Also, in terms of things to love about the 64, was the fact that the system came with four built-in controller ports, as opposed to only two, like on the Sega Saturn. There was a huge amount of Nintendo 64 games that offered four-player multiplayer, effectively making it one of the very best party systems of all time. Want to play a system alongside three friends? Then in all likelihood, the Nintendo 64 was for you. I must give an honourable shout out to the GameCube and the Dreamcast though, for essentially carrying on this innovation. The 64 may trounce the Saturn in this department, however that doesn't mean there isn't some massive multiplayer games on this system too. Check out Saturn Bomberman for example. This game offers a whopping 8 person multiplayer, 
where you can go around the map blowing up and destroying all of your friendships. Essentially, this game offers the best home console Bomberman experience you could possibly ask for, and the single player campaign is great fun too, featuring interesting maps, enemies, and a cracking soundtrack. The Nintendo 64, on the other hand, offers four other Bomberman games of its own, none of which can compete with the Marvel, which is Saturn Bomberman. Many games within the Saturn library, such as Saturn Bomberman, also regularly offer full motion pre-rendered cutscenes, much like the games we had on the Sony PlayStation 2. The Nintendo 64, on the other hand, lacks these in the majority of its games, as Nintendo opted to use the inferior cartridge-based format for the platform. Cartridges offered an embarrassingly pathetic amount of storage in them in comparison to CDs. So non-essential elements in games, such as pre-rendered cutscenes, sadly were missing from the majority of Nintendo games. The Nintendo 64's storage system certainly had its limitations, so we never get to see massive long games on the system, such as Final Fantasy VII. On the bright side though, at least the system didn't really feature any low times, which is sadly pretty much a part of every game released today. Back on the subject of the games themselves though, many people would agree that GoldenEye was probably the best first person shooter over the period, and was so ahead of its time that nothing on either the PlayStation or the Saturn could compete with the game within that particular genre. Although dated looking today, and a bit uncomfortable to play now, at the time the game was easily the best FPS game ever seen on a console, if not perhaps full stop. The Nintendo 64 may have had a great first person shooter, however the Saturn had an ace up its sleeve of its own, a third person shooter, the likes of which nothing on the Nintendo platform could compete with, and that game was Burning Rangers. Burning Rangers is set in a futuristic society in which fire is the only remaining danger. Players control one of an elite group of firefighters, the Burning Rangers, who extinguish fires and rescue civilians in burning buildings. Like Fireman on the Super Nintendo that came before it, this is another game within the firefighting genre focused around saving people rather than simply killing them, like in more low-brow games like Cold and I. This is a fun game within the third-person shooting genre, and certainly better than any third-person shooter I can think of on the Nintendo 64. Speaking of shooting, let's talk about space shmups. To my knowledge, the Nintendo 64 doesn't offer any, whereas the Sega Saturn, on the other hand, offers bloody loads. Probably the most notable and beloved game out of all of the space shooters on the system is Radiant Silver Gun. This vertically scrolling shooter was developed by Treasure, the same lovely people who brought us Gunstar Heroes. There is a lot of great games of this style on the system. Just to name a few, we have Battle Gregor, Darius Gaiden, Galactic Attack, Gunbird, Gradius, Thunder Force, and of course, Sexy Parodius. And no, I am not using sexy as an adjective to describe the Parodius franchise. Sexy Parodius is the legitimate name of the fifth entry in its series. I suppose one of Shmup's closest relatives is probably Row Shooters. I think it's pretty neck and neck with the top games available in this genre across the 64 and the Saturn. In the Nintendo 64's corner, we have two great games in this genre. Firstly, and most famously in the West, we have Star Fox 64, also known as Lilac Wars in many regions. This game pretty much builds on everything presented in the SNES game in the series, but applies snazzier graphics, new gameplay mechanics, and even voice acting. To this day, Nintendo have been completely incapable of producing a Star Fox game that can match this one. Instead, we have had to put up with moronic dual screen motion control madness. Yuck. Also in Nintendo's corner, we have Sin and Punishment, which was released exclusively in Japan on the Nintendo 64, and also on the often forgotten Nintendo console, the IQ player over in China. This somewhat hidden gem was actually made as a collaboration between Nintendo and Treasure, 
in sort of a dream team scenario. As expected with such a pairing, this is actually one of the finest games on the whole Nintendo 64. The Saturn also has two great RAL shooters of its own, in the form of the first two Pan's Dragoon games. The Pan's Dragoon series takes place on an unspecified post-apocalyptic planet, where the people compete for land, resources and the technology of the ancients. The player controls a member of a hunting party who becomes the rider of a powerful blue dragon. Both of these games are arguably just as good as Star Fox 64, and the first of the two acted as one of the launch titles for the Saturn. One peripheral the Nintendo 64 was lacking in comparison to the Sega Saturn was a light gun, automatically discluding a whole genre of games from ever appearing on the platform. The Sega Saturn's virtual gun allowed us to play quality light gun games such as the Die Hard Trilogy, Virtual Cop 1 and 2 and House of the Dead. The Saturn successfully pulls off the light gun genre with style. All of these games are such great fun to play and are leagues ahead of Duck Hunt and Yoshi Safari for example. The Sega Saturn pretty much brings the arcade light gun experience home to your living room. And bloody hell is it fun to kill enemies using this thing. Next, let's talk about RPGs. Once again, the Sega Saturn trounces the Nintendo 64 in this category. The Nintendo 64 sadly only offers one high quality JRPG on the entire platform. One would gather this is probably most likely due to the storage limitations in which the cartridges have. Nintendo still managed to produce Paper Mario though, which is artistically a beautiful game and an extremely worthy sequel to Mario RPG on the Super Nintendo. This game feels almost as big and epic as a Final Fantasy game from the period, which I guess must have been achievable due to the simpler graphics. A fantastic effort from Nintendo, so it's a crying shame really that this is the only decent RPG we've got on the platform. The Saturn on the other hand offered a wide range of choice, especially for the Japanese. There is actually tons of decent ones, much like shoot 'em ups The Saturn received two Grandia games, Albert Odyssey, two Lunar games, multiple Lang Grisol games, the Shining Force 3 trilogy and the most critically acclaimed game of all on the system, Panzer Dragoon Saga. When you have a plethora of big name RPGs like this spread across the turn based and strategy genres then any RPG fan is going to want to pick the Sega Saturn over the Nintendo 64 every single damn time. Now let's talk about racing games briefly. The two platforms were made famous by racing games offering completely different flavours. The Nintendo 64 is mostly known for Mario Kart and Diddy Kong Racing whilst the Sega Saturn on the other hand is fondly remembered for Sega Rally and Daytona USA. These titles are amongst the most popular games on both platforms and it is really hard to try and compare them in much detail. I guess the easiest conclusion to draw from this was that the Nintendo 64 was the king of the kart genre whereas the Saturn on the other hand made more of a name for itself with realistic looking rally games. Another area where the Sega Saturn thoroughly rapes Nintendo is within the genre of 2D side-scrollers. Only two decent ones jump to mind on the Nintendo 64. The first being Yoshi Story, which pales in comparison to Yoshi's Island on the Super Nintendo, and Mischief Maker, a fun game once again brought to us by Treasure. The Saturn, on the other hand, has so many decent side-scrollers. Rayman, Mega Man 8, Mega Man X3, Mega Man X4, Symphony of the Night, Metal Slug and Sonic Jam which includes all of the classic Sonic games from the Mega Drive. On top of all of this greatness we have some great 2.5D games too such as Pandemonium and most famously of all Nights into Dreams. Nights into Dreams with its unique concept and gameplay is probably one of the most memorable exclusives on the whole Saturn platform. Even Mario creator Mr Miyagi himself admits to loving this one. Speaking of side scrollers, the high quality doesn't stop there either. Oh no no no. The best side scrolling beat em up on the Saturn is Treasures Guardian Heroes. This game even has RPG elements in the gameplay too, to innovate slightly from the norm of the genre. 
once again a fun and extremely memorable game, with nothing to even really compare it to on the Nintendo 64. In the world of fighters, the Saturn has plenty of memorable games within its arsenal too. The Street Fighter series, the Virtual Fighter games, Fighting Vipers, Fighters Mega Mix, the list goes on and on. The Saturn is a really strong platform for games of this genre of gaming. The most memorable pure fighter on the other hand of the Nintendo 64 was Killer Instinct Gold, which certainly isn't as good as the Street Fighter series and doesn't match up very well to its arcade counterpart, Killer Instinct 2 either. The Nintendo 64 though does have one unforgettable fighter, if you can really even call it that, Super Smash Bros. Although nothing in comparison to later games in the series, Super Smash Bros offered up the blueprint of what was to come and offered a unique fighting game experience which differs massively in terms of mechanics to any games in the genre that had been made before it. As we all know, it is great fun beating the living crap out of Nintendo's top IPs. I don't often get the opportunity to punch Link in his girly face. So, to answer my clickbaity thumbnail question of is the Sega Saturn better than the Nintendo 64, let us summarise the case I have made. Best 3D platformers, best kart racers, best first person shooter, Zelda games, best multiplayer, shorter loading times are all fantastic reasons to love the Nintendo 64. However today, I have chosen the Saturn as my favourite due to the better 2D platformers, the best RPGs of all styles, best fighters, best third person shooter, best rally racers, best shoot 'em ups, light gun games, CDs with pre-rendered cutscenes, and overall a bigger and more diverse library with 597 games over the 64's 388 games, which are mainly sports titles. As you can see from this simple chart, the systems are both extremely lovable for very different reasons. However, from my personal studies and preferences, I would give the Sega Saturn the edge in terms of which system offers the player more experiences. However, this is all obviously completely subjective and just my personal opinions. I suppose quite a diplomatic way to summarise my views would be if you are looking for a multiplayer experience, pick the Nintendo 64 every single time. If you are looking for longevity and single player games, then you are going to find a lot more fun in the Saturn. Either way, regardless of my opinions, if you have never found the time for the Sega Saturn, I suggest you do that now, because as you can see there is a wealth of high quality games to be played on the thing. Not bad at all when you consider many people have this odd idea that the Saturn doesn't have any games. As someone who grew up with the 64, I'd never want to take those fantastic memories away. However, part of me wishes I had found a way to experience the Saturn over the period too. Let me know what you thought of my analysis. Did I leave any key elements out of weighing up which system is better today? Which of these two systems do you think you need to spend more time with? Let me know in the comment section. Don't forget to also like and subscribe too. Thank you for watching today's video. Shout out to Shizuka Kebayashi, Brad Warren, Retail Archaeology, Andrew Bazanski, Peter's Dawn, Mike Frost, Edward O'Reilly, Atlas Garcia, and all of my other patrons. Thank you for all of your support. Yeah! You give me a reason to wake up in the mornings! Ta-ta and farewell.